It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dame Caroline Dynage, MP for Gosport, um, who is chair of the um, uh, Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, which has a, an amazing portfolio, I should imagine. Um, and uh, she is a ministerial responsibility for online safety bill. Also, her other duties are chair of the CMS Select Committee. Um, she is a member of the Women and Equalities Select Committee. Um, and co-chair of the Parliamentary Internet Communications and Technology Forum, which we know as PIC4. Caroline, would you like to come up and, and speak? Thank you very much. Well, that was an introduction. I don't know if I can live up to that now. I've dragged you all in from your, cafe from your caffeine. Um, uh, as a political uh, person, ladies and gentlemen, you never quite know how you're going to be introduced <laughs> at an event. Our, um, our foreign secretary once went to a school where he was introduced by one little girl as the right horrible David Cameron. So, <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here at a complicated time, a bit of an existential time for technology and AI. Why do I say that? I'm the chair of the uh, Culture Media and Sports Select Committee. It used to be the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Then there was a big machinery of government change and the digital was taken away, but not before we could look at uh, the issues of connected technology. It was one of the uh, inquiries we did last year with the Select Committee and looking at um, the opportunities, but also some of the dangers of connected technology. We looked at how um, things like uh, uh, doorbells, smart doorbells and, and smart speakers and uh, baby monitors could be used by um, perpetrators of domestic violence to continue to target their, their victims. So an interesting time. It's a time of excitement and apprehension, a time of opportunity and challenge, and a time of enlightenment and confusion. In my lifetime, I'm very old, so in my lifetime I have seen a lot of changes in technology. It's come in a series of very rapid waves. I was there for the dot-com bubble um, and the dominance of the smartphone. I remember a world before when phones had wires attached to them and of course now the introduction of you know VR headsets, the metaverse, this morning, my select committee uh, were conducting our inquiry into uh, film and high-end TV, and we had the brilliant uh, director, James Hawes, who's just um, directed the movie um, One Life, about the story of Sir Nicholas Winton with, um, uh, with Anthony Hopkins, and he spoke about uh, his fears about generative AI. He spoke about how the, the, um, the Sora... Uh, generative AI. I don't know if you've seen the Sora app, which is now able to, um, the, the, this, the Sora tool, which is now able to, um, as of last week, was uh, publishing basically video, um, generative video, and, and his fears about how in about 18 months' time it will be able to produce you know, medium-range TV shows, things like soap operas, entirely AI-generated. It's an entirely new world for, for some. So we're clearly in a very fast-moving period today and finding that we have to deal with the implications of those changes. And when technology rapidly evolves, we, of course, have to balance the way it benefits our day-to-day -day lives while making sure that it works for everybody and that everyone is protected and that's why today's discussion is so pertinent you will of course be hearing from people who know a lot more about this than I do thank goodness for that um, and it's while it seems for example that a policy of patient passports which I think would provide a single system to keep track of medical records throughout a person's life that would be popular with eight out of ten people. There doesn't seem to be a reason why that wouldn't be any good, but of course the pe patient needs to have confidence in how that data is being stored, who has access to it. And of course, to what extent the bias, unconscious or otherwise, of the person that creates the system is incorporated in any form of uh, programme. But our understanding of how technology can be used is changing, and we must remain alive to the challenges of data privacy and the implications of using that technology and who might have access to it. Not, of course, what we're not saying is that technology is an evil beast that needs to be restrained at every turn. Far from it. We've got so much opportunity, so much competitive advantage in the global marketplace to be harnessed. But, um, and, you know, and as I was the Minister for Digital in the pandemic, and I saw firsthand how the tech se sector was able to pivot to support people in, uh, in virtually every aspect of their lives. Google became the new classroom, Zoom became the new boardroom, uh, Netflix became the new cinema, 
Uh, so tech was vital to the way that we worked, to the way that we learned, the way that we communicated, the way that we socialised. It brought a whole range of new uh, words into our lexicon, things like, you're on mute. And, uh, of course, virtual pub quizzes, who could forget that? And home workouts, which, of course, I never really got um, involved in. You can see that. But now the pandemic is over, we cannot allow that sense of responsibility to users um, uh, from technology to go away. So today, we, of course, are joined by experts who are going to be able to discuss just that with you, which is why I'm especially delighted to uh, introduce Simon Toe to give a keynote speech before the discussion this afternoon afternoon. Now, Simon is a professor and a consultant surgeon at Portsmouth Hospital's University NHS Trust and the University of Portsmouth. And I know that he will give important insight into this subject area, not least because he is a great expert in it, but actually more importantly, because he comes from God's chosen city, uh, the home of the best football team on earth, and indeed my birthplace, Portsmouth. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Toe. Thanks very much, Dame Danich, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, isn't it wonderful? This is a view of um, Portsmouth, actually, from your constituency, Gosport, which I had a privilege to look after, the good people of Portsmouth for Gosport for the last 23 years. So I'm here really to try and encapsulate this topic in 15 minutes, which is a tall order, and I'll do the best I can. Basically, the NHS is transforming, and transforming really fast into becoming a digital healthcare. Uh, service and we need to understand how that future looks like and how wearables particularly will feature in that and I hope they would inspire you to um, consider how important that is actually far more important than we realize um, the health care that we have now will be unrecognizable I think in five to ten years time so the question I just want to pose today is can medtech particularly use wearables make a difference to what the healthcare is today. And I hope to see that at the end of this, the answer that you, you, you will come to is yes. So I, when Rajiv asked me to do this talk, it's tricky. I'm not a cyber security expert. I'm a surgeon. Uh, but I do, do some research. And I'm also involved with some med tech companies. And uh, I guess these are the, the sort of credentials I put up there just to sort of um, explain to you why I'm here today. Firstly, for the past three years, I've been involved in something called a site program. This is a business support program to the University of Portsmouth. And we support over 200 medtech, uh, UK medtech SMEs in the South mainly, to try and bring their products to market and benefit NHS patients as quickly as possible. Um, and it's been a privilege to work with these companies, and I will mention one of them uh, called EarSwitch uh, later on in this presentation. The second thing is I've been involved in the last two years with a company called Concentric to try and bring in digital consent. And moment, as you know, when you come to an operation, you have to sign a, a piece of paper. Uh, you often can't read what the doctor's saying, and they are too polite to say, I can't read the handwriting. Well, digital consent takes away all that uncertainty and a lot more. And I'll try and see whether we can get some lessons from our SBRR study that could be applied to wearables. And, find, and finally, I'm a founder of a, my own startup, and I'll share my experience of that along the way. Probably the most important thing why Rajiv asked me, actually, is none of that, but because I've been a consultant surgeon for the last 23 years in Portsmouth, and I've had the privilege of looking after patients, especially um, patients with cancer, but also looking after acute patients and patients coming through a &E. And so I have, this, I have the perspective that um, we have real problems in NHS. We know that we have long waiting lists, and one of the few things we have done and embraced in Portsmouth, which I will share today, is that we've embraced uh, digital tech in such a way that I can proudly say today that Portsmouth has the fewest long waiters in the whole UK as it stands. And what I, I, I put three reasons up there, and there are many, many others. But from the surgical perspective, it's because I think we embrace technology, we have a vital packs early warning system that detects patients who are ill and able to reduce their complications and their stay. Likewise, we've got a lot of AI and, and IT systems to improve patient flow. And finally, perhaps a bit I'm more excited about because I'm a, uh, a surgeon, is I've championed robotic surgery. And I believe that technology used properly 
can actually reduce complications and also say, especially for very complex cancers. So this is the topics I want to cover, and I'll go through it in time. But like Professor Finkelstein, I'm actually going to tell a story at the end, because I think that really encapsulates how I believe healthcare matters. You know, it's, it's the patient that is important, not what I do or what I say. So I'll touch that in a second. So the NHS long-term plan, um, and someone touched on it earlier today, but basically why are medtech solutions important, especially wearables, to fulfill this long-term plan? I think this is the direction of travel for the NHS. Um, some hospitals are on that journey far more forward than others, but most of us will get there in the end. This includes healthy aging, uh, preventing chronic conditions like diabetes, obesity, improving outcomes from heart disease, from cancer, and using tech really to help us to become better doctors and nurses. Um, we're heading towards a paperless net zero future. What's that look like? And I think we just got to be prepared for that. I'm particularly keen, in fact, to use tech to empower patients to look after themselves better. That's one of the reasons for the company we set up. And in this respect, I think wearables has the most potential. So one solution we're banking on is to accelerate the up, uptake, really, of medical devices. And to this end, uh, various organizations like the AAC, which helps entrepreneurs like me, accelerate the um, uptake, really, of new medical devices in the NHS. Uh, one of them, by the way, is on that slide called a gamma core, is exciting uh, device that patients use to reduce cluster headaches, so it avoids them having to take tablets, and they can administer themselves without any supervision. So these are the kind of devices that we hope we'll, we'll see more and more of in the NHS. So I'm going to put this slide up only because I was asked to talk about rights, and basically all of us know this. All right? The NHS is no different from any other organizations. We are subject to GDPR, and this is the uh, laudable objectives of GDPR and enforced by the Information Commission, and that remains uh, for us as well as for any other organization. Now, I'm well aware, I put down the bottom there because I know Dame Dinesh mentioned it, that there's a data protection and digital information bill going right through Parliament, I believe, in the House of Lords in its final reading. And that, we hope, will help us adopt MedTech more securely and rapidly to overcome our current crises in NHS. So, briefly, I'm just going to cover a few things about how it happens on a macro level in the NHS. Um, so NHS Digital, particularly NHS England Cyber Operations, helps us on the ground level in hospital protect ourselves from cyber attacks. And these include, for example, alerts. These are ones last week that were sent to our IT team. And because I'm involved in it, I get copies of these as well. Um, we have a firewall in every day. Three billion transacts, transactions occur in NHS mostly in, within the hospital, but increasingly between hospitals. And that's really important, the between hospital bit, because uh, in the paper system we had in the past, if you ended up in the wrong hospital, you have no idea what's wrong with you. And patients often get poor care if they're not in the right hospital. Well, hopefully, nowadays, you can access data 24-7 from any hospital in the UK. So that firewall protects us. Um, we also have... Um, support about vulnerability, sorry, we, the NHS cyber operations also scans us for vulnerabilities and tells us how good or bad we are. And perhaps the most important thing they do is awareness, the level that is important. So one of the weakest links in the NHS is us, basically. So it is not because we've got a weak firewall, it's because we don't, as clinicians, as nurses, look after um, our data well. We leave computers on, on the ward. I still see it when I walk around, when I walk around yesterday, I had a rep around a few junior doctors, and um, we share passwords, and we don't use two-step verification when we should do. So all these other things that we need to do to secure. So the weakest link is definitely us, and therefore, although, yes, firewalls are important, awareness is, I think, more important, certainly for us in the NHS. And finally, what about patients? I mean, what's the point of having med tech if patients don't trust it and don't use it? Uh, one of the unintended consequences of the pandemic is that virtually all of us in this room, I think we had lots of hands up earlier, use the NHS app. 
And I used it in a few weeks ago to contact my own GP, and it's fantastic. You can get your blood results, you can get your appointments, you can get one-to-one -one care from your GP quite, quite successfully and quickly. Um, and I was so impressed by it. And I think that bodes well for any med tech that we use in the future. But there's so much more we can use our smartphone for than just the NHS app. And I hope to sort of inspire you a bit later on in this talk. Sorry. The other thing that the NHS does is that we're pretty good at trying to work with third parties to bring in the med tech. The problem we have is that the process is pretty rigorous and quite onerous for the company. And you'd be glad to know I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail, except to say that we hope the new bill will make this a bit easier. So an example. So I work with a company called Concentric. Concentric is a digital consent platform. Uh, patients can remotely consent to their operation anytime they want in the comfort of their home. They don't have to do it in the, in the busyness of a clinic. Uh, and they can read through it and understand and have true what we call shared decision making rather than just sign this form, please, you're going to have this operation. Um, this is the steps that Concentric had to go through, and we had to go through this. And it took us nearly two years to complete all these steps on this slide in order for us to allow Concentric to access patient data. And I guess all that effort you might ask whether is it worth it? Is it worth doing, doing this? Well, it's an industry leading digital consent platform. It reduces the complications, I think, and the worries that patients have. And as a result, we won an award last year um, on empowering patients, which we're pretty proud of. So wearable tech. I'm going to finish off by talking about Health tech mainly, although I just want to use this slide to say that there are synergies between us and tech that we use in sports as well as in gaming. We use AR and VR in the operating theater today. And even with the fashion industry, and that's a fantastic invention by a Nigerian entrepreneur called Smart Bra to detect cancer early. I, as for the men in this room, I'm hoping someone will invent a smart pants to, dis <laughs> to, dis to detect testicular cancer early. So, the risks I've outlined again um, on this slide. And if we get it all right and we can mitigate all these risks, I personally think that the benefits outweigh those risks. And the benefits are, as we see there, better remote care for our patients and also better, um, better, sorry, and also better satisfaction from our patients about the care they receive from us. Now, I'm going to finish off with a story, and this is a lovely patient. He's a 72-year-old retired postman who, called Tony, who basically has a groin hernia, which he discovers while he was um, in the gym. And it's a painful lump. He goes and contacts his GP, waits 30 minutes, listening to music, finally gets through to his GP, who sees him, writes a letter. He gets a consult, a paper consent, which he can't read, but he's too polite, and he signs it anyway. He then has to wait a year for his assessment and then his surgery. And during his surgery, because he's diabetic, he needs regular blood tests before and afterwards. And then he has four hourly observations, so he doesn't get a decent night's sleep in the hospital. And he goes home with some paper information that he doesn't read either. And then a week later, he's worried about an infection. He calls out his GP. The GP says that's absolutely fine. Discovers he hasn't been wearing his stockings to stop dermatosis, and then had to educate him about that. So a long journey, not too happy a patient. So what would it look like, a typical patient journey? And some of these steps already exist uh, in Portsmouth and other hospitals. The patient uses the NHS app, contacts his GP, gets an e-consult, an e-referral, uh, goes to a dedicated hub. We have one in Portsmouth, and the patient is seen within three weeks of that referral, uh, puts on a assess, assess immediately so it doesn't have to wait, and then he gets onto a short waiting list, goes in for a surgery. Uh, conveniently, he also has a um, wearable app to monitor his diabetes. We'll mention that later, earlier. He then wears a wearable called ear switch that monitors his ops so he doesn't get disturbed by a nurse and gets a good night's sleep in hospital, which is very rare. And finally goes home. When he's, when, the, when he's worried about his care at home, the GP accesses his remote monitoring, reassures him he's fine. We also give him an app to take so he knows how to wear his stockings properly and avoid any complications. So let me just cover these two wearables uh, very quickly before I finish. So 
he's got this glucose level sensor. And this sensor allows us to monitor his glucose in real time, uh, access to an app, and it means that we can manage his diabetes, which is tricky during surgery, much more easily. Um, and he doesn't need fingerprints. In fact, he, he manages the, the care completely himself without the nurse um, because he can manage it very well. Now, interestingly, this app also allows you to remotely monitor someone else's um, diabetic control. So I've got a mother of a teenager who is a diabetic, and he went on his gap year to Thailand, and his mother could monitor his glucose. And in fact, when he became hypoglycemic, she could contact her friends, his friends directly before he passes out on the beach somewhere. So it really has benefits, and clearly attaching to a pump means it can be done automatically. So what about ear switch? Well, ear switch is a fantastic invention by a fellow entrepreneur called um, Nick Gompertz. He's a GP from Bath, and he realized that SATS monitors are not accurate in patients with different colored skin. But the eardrum is the same for all of us. And therefore, he has a, a, a device that repurposes standard hearing aids, which is in a lot of older people, to measure all those observations. And that's really amazing, because that means we don't have to have a nurse doing observations at all. And finally, um, what we're doing with Velma, this is a simple reminder app. It's on the phone. We set it up in patients, and we remind them to wear stockings, inject heparin, take tablets, exercise, all those things that a doctor asks you to do after surgery to recover quicker. And we know that this improves compliance um, amazingly. We won a fair number of awards as a result of that, and we hope to be able to launch this app later this year. So what about Tony, uh, my postman? Well, he managed to get to Lanzarote to celebrate his 73-year birthday party with his family. And a very happy patient indeed. So in summary, um, I think medtech and wearables is undoubtedly the future of healthcare. Most of us uh, are worried about safety, but provided we are vigilant, I think the benefits overcome the risks. Um, whatever tech that is, it has to be, as I say, inclusive and engaging. Uh, it, otherwise, patients just won't use it. Um, I believe it will reduce waiting lists, it will improve patient flow, it will stop ambulances queuing outside our hospitals, and I'm hoping, above all else, it will empower my patients to look after themselves better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, that's a great setup for the, for the next panel session. Um, and it's great to have a positive. Um, we've had some quite negative discussion today, quite rightly, but it's great to have a positive of what we can see in the future. Um, let's hope it doesn't go down, downhill too much before drinks in terms of the cybersecurity, the privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right, so the next session, panel session, is citizens' rights and cybersecurity implications of wearable technologies, um, which really moves forward from Simon's talk. So I want to introduce Peter. Peter is another of our wonderful um, uh, um, synthesis fellows. Um, he does it remotely from the Netherlands, and, and he's always checking us on the philosophy, the ethics of what we're doing. He's always behind me saying, can we publish this paper in this place, and is it the right thing to do? He's on the case, so uh, um, I'll let you introduce the next session, and yourself, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, what an introduction. Um, yeah, I will do an unusual uh, introduction of myself. So there is almost no, as you have heard, there is almost no country in Europe where I haven't uh, studied, uh, worked, or done some research. I'm quite an international guy, so uh, I'm very, I was very pleased when, and surprised to be invited to join UCL and Petros. Uh, I think I'm the longest serving uh, synthesis fellow by now, uh, two, uh, two and a half years. All, 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 I think it's now three. And uh, it's been an absolute uh, amazing uh, yeah, experience, and, and, and I learned a lot, uh, and uh, an amazing team. So thank you again for, for joining uh, this group. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an applied philosopher, so uh, yeah, what a philosopher does is usually thinking about difficult topics and trying to find a problem where there aren't any. <laughs> and 
and uh, at the same time I try to do some some applied research as well so uh, I'm, sometimes I try to solve those problems or provide some some suggestions to solutions and this is how I joined Petras uh, we've done some amazing research across uh, with multiple of you I think I've seen uh, yeah, Stephen, Hazel, and some others who, we, who we've done some, some amazing research, I think. Uh, and I think that's, all, that's enough about me. Uh, I would like to invite the panelists for this uh, last discussion of today uh, before the coffee uh, and the drinks. Uh, Julie Dawson, uh, please take a seat. And uh, I will call you then after the, um, behind the, this lectern to, to provide a, or give a, a proper introduction. Next time is Mike Hobby. And finally, uh, Mariam uh, Mehmezdad. Hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think I, I will uh, uh, call Julie behind this lectern. I think you have some slides, so here's the, the control. Thank you, thank you. Please. So just to provide a little bit of context, I know today health has been a big focus. Yeah, um, at my company, Yoti, we've been looking at how do people prove who they are and how old they are, which is slightly different, but fits into health as, many, as well as many other different areas. Um, and specifically, what I wanted to also say was linking to the DPDI bill that's been mentioned. Reusable digital identity is something that's being looked at in the UK, across Europe, in many different places around the world. The UK has set up a trust framework for digital identity. We are one of those organisations accredited to it. And under that, there are schemes for different sectors that are coming through. Um, and one of those, as not yet, could in the future be health. Go to the next slide, please. I don't know if it's a clicker. Ah, we have a clicker. Perfect. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit of a view as to how could a reusable digital ID work for those of you that might not have ever set one up. So we've let... 14 million people around the world set one up, chosen to add a document, set up the app, and after that, we give them the private key on the secure module of their device. So it's a bit like a private permission distributed ledger, but with a non-relational database at the core. So all those 14 million people, we do not know who is doing what. We don't know who's sharing an over-18 going into a cinema. We don't know who's sharing their ID details, paying their taxes in the states of Jersey, logging into um, public services in Scotland. Each of those is sharded and um, set out separately. And those are accredited in the UK for various use cases for right to work, for right to rent, for criminal records checks. During the pandemic, which obviously we've referred to a lot for the NHS, for instance, has enabled staff to have ID cards. So say you were hiring a, um, a surgeon in Portsmouth, they wouldn't have to physically go in person, share all their documents. They could have their app set up. If they changed role, that could be updated remotely, etc. And they weren't having to show bits of plastic, but that could enable physical or digital access. Um, and enable, obviously, you know, scalability, less easy to lose that, etc. And then during the pandemic, other things arose. So in order to travel, in lots of instances, when you were going through international airports, each country would say, ha, huh, this is now the bar to get into my country. If you want to come in, maybe on paper, maybe digitally, you would be showing either a test result or a vaccine result. So those were things we worked on alongside 150 other companies as part of the Good Health Pass Collaborative, which is an interesting work if ever someone wants to see that. Um, here is just an example of the sorts of things you might see with the, the staff ID. You might have as an individual your personal details, your ID documents, but then you could actually see your role um, and see different credentials about that individual verified status, and they could show that in person or share elements of that digitally. We did this similarly for lots of volunteers during COVID. So obviously, if you were um, a volunteer with Age UK or other organizations, they wanted to know, were you actually the right person? And could you share that both digitally and in person? Um, and obviously, that was something that was highly sensitive and needed to, to be secure. So hopefully, you're seeing some links now with, with some of the areas that you've been talking about. How can you challenge validity, for instance, of a verified credential? 
Um, so we've worked with lots of different bodies around the world, such as HIPAA, one of the, the health credentials reviewing organizations. Age was mentioned earlier. Um, we've done over 600 million age checks for a wide range of sectors around the world. Um, is someone actually an adult to enter into a contract? or enter age-restricted um, goods and services. And we're going to see health as schemes coming through. If you look at EIDAS across Europe, every EU citizen will have a reusable digital identity in the next years. And already there are pilots moving as to how could this be used in other sectors. The UK hasn't as yet set up a scheme which refers to health. Um, that might happen in a number of different ways. But reusable digital identities are being used by citizens and verified credentials based on the W3C standards model are currently the open standard approach that people are looking at linked to reusable digital identities. So that was my whistle stop tour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, uh, no PowerPoint no presentation PowerPoint. from me. You'll be sort of maybe pleased to know, I don't know. Um, so I'm from Cambridge Consultants on our MedTech division. I'm the associate director there. And what we mainly undertake are the most complex uh, business hurdles uh, around health. So one day we might be speaking about a digital wearable or even an implant, a wireless pacemaker. The next we might be talking about a combinational drug using maybe a hydrogel and how that might help with wound care that's connected again with another wearable device. Or we might be looking at the very serious problem of data, how it's stored, how it's maintained, how it's looked after, and making sure the patient's welfare is, is priority at all times. But the underlying thing we're always bearing in mind when we're doing this is how do we create an era of predictable and preventable health? To Simon's point earlier, everything we're doing now is about how do we reduce the patient influx into hospitals? How do we spot the early warning signs? How do we ensure that care is delivered in a timely way, making sure a cancer is caught early or is detected at its earliest point? where CAR T-cell therapy may be the solution rather than invasive surgery? Or how do we use genetic DNA profiles to ensure that the care delivered, the drug that I'm going to use, is actually personalised to that group of patients and will be most effective? So it's those challenges I get involved with on a daily basis, and I have to say I thoroughly enjoy it, and I think it's the reason I get up in the morning and it's the reason I go to work. And the colleagues I work with too, I'm proud to say, are really motivated by that goal in life. So uh, I look forward to some of the questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And finally, not, not, not least, yeah, please go ahead. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Mernejad. I'm an associate professor at Royal Holloway University of London. And I was, um, I led one of the Petras projects called Cypher Cybersecurity Privacy Bias and Trust in Female Oriented Technologies or Femtech. For those of you who don't know what is Femtech, they are a subcategory of digital health technologies that uh, support women's um, health in different categories, physical, mental, emotional, and sexual. They come in various forms and shapes including websites, mobile apps, and here in this slide, IoT devices, focusing on pregnancy, fertility, uh, menopause, and beyond. The industry is expanding, and most of these devices do not advertise themselves or brand themselves as uh, a medical products, which creates a little bit of problem in, um, when it comes to the practices of data uh, process, uh, collecting and processing. Right. What we do is that we look at this ecosystem comprehensively, meaning that we look at the uh, hardware security and privacy practices, including IoT devices, Bluetooth communication, and beyond. We also look at uh, software elements, such as apps and websites. We look at um, problems associated with misinformation or disinformation on, for example, dark web, we also look at data, um, machine learning, and AI bias and discrimination when it comes to the data or the modeling of the algorithms. And uh, 
Similarly, we look at the data tracking practices, other cybersecurity and privacy issues such as data leakage and sharing, and of course, human dimensions and the legal elements of this ecosystem. Because we look at this ecosystem comprehensively, we publish papers in all these categories, including systems and algorithms, users and regulations. Uh, all our papers are written in an accessible way, meaning that even if you don't have a system security background, which is the case with myself and most of my team members, you would still be able to read and understand these papers contributing to your field of study or practice. This is, for example, one of the system security setups of our experiments. Here, what we are doing, we are intercepting the data communication between a Bluetooth-enabled IoT device branded as Femtech and the, and the mobile app and um, perform a wide range of attacks, putting the security and privacy of the user and potentially they say their safe, safety at risk. We communicate all of our findings with the industry and help them to improve their products um, uh, for a better versions in the future. We also do uh, user studies, which is going to be uh, the point of the conversation discussion uh, today. But uh, what we find that a lot of the users care about the cybersecurity and privacy practices of uh, these products, as opposed to the idea of who cares and why should I care. And our findings are consistent with those of that were reported by the ICO last year. And finally, because we've been working on this project for a few years now, we, we understand that communicating the, secure, the complex risks and harms of these technologies with the public and colleagues across disciplines and other stakeholders is a very difficult task. And that's why, with support of Petras, we worked on an art science exhibition in the last two years, which we delivered in the summer. And it's permanently archived on the university website, partially went to the v &A Museum. It's a work of 20 different uh, researchers, industrial partners, artists, and designers. And I have a few leaflets today with me if you are interested to learn about the complex risks and harms and discuss them better. That's it, I think. Oh, yes. And apart from the Cypher project, I'm also a part of another project called Agency that I continue the same work that I've been doing on Femtech cybersecurity and privacy. We've been very lucky to be supported by various funding bodies and universities and industry to uh, work on the important topics of security and privacy and bias and trust, um, focusing on gender in digital health. That's it. Yeah. I think finish. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start with the question, a question to the audience. Um, how many of you are wearing some sort of like a fit tracker, smartwatch? And uh, how many of you hate the, the data, the health related data that it, is, it provides you? Hate. Hate, like you don't like the results. You, you, it means that you, you, you like uh, checking your, your data. I'm also interested about my heart rate after being on this panel. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, because this, this panel will be starting with the, with the topic of data, but uh, a, a special uh, group of data is the, the sensitive data, which, which falls under a dedicated uh, regulation as well, the, the health-related data and uh, what, what, uh, through these variables. And my first question will be to, to Mariam. Uh, what privacy and security uh, concerns associated with storing sensitive health data on uh, service platforms uh, 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 are there and uh, how can they be mitigated? You know, yeah. the... So that's a very general question. Yeah. I think I covered that a little bit in one of yeah. my slides that when you look at the ecosystem, the threat uh, vector, as we call it, is very general. But when, when it comes to uh, digital health data, there are, ra uh, apart from the general security and privacy issues associated with this data, there is also the um, sensitive and uh, intimate nature of this type of data that makes it attracted, attractive to other threat actors, again, as we call it in system security. And those threat actors could be anyone from your partner, family member, employer, um, health insurance companies, um, research companies, even the government. We also have evidence that there is uh, 
there are political and sometimes religious organizations interested in this type of data for particular reasons. And uh, those are the type of security and privacy implications um, associated with this data. In terms of mitigation, well, uh, if we knew, <laughs> we would have been in a much better position today. I think this is a very, again, a very general and ongoing research problem in the community. Obviously, we have the GDPR compliance practices. We have the privacy by design principles. We have sensitive design approaches. There is some a new um, notion in security called participatory threat modeling, which uh, pays attention to the context of the technology, which is very helpful as a mitigation method. But obviously, I see it as a, a problem for, um, for a multidisciplinary research yeah. community to tackle over time. Yeah. Uh, to, to further specify then my question a bit, uh, when we were preparing for this, for this panel discussion, you, you, you said one specific sentence that, that triggered me. Uh, that was that uh, whether, whether uh, uh, sh data sharing only saves lives or it, whether it can kill as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I made that note, yes. I, and I think um, I probably have borrowed it from somewhere. Mm. It's not my own quote. But basically, it, it was inspired by the data collection and sharing during COVID time, that everyone was convinced that by data sharing, we are saving lives. It's quite important to pay attention that by data sharing, we might also kill. Mm -hmm. And that comes down to the uh, socio-technical, socio -technical, cultural elements of these, these systems. But also, when it comes to some type of attacks that, for example, we are running on an insulin pump, for example, if we modify, if an attacker, we wouldn't do it, but if an attacker modify that data flow, that would then end in a, a catastrophe, basically, yeah. right? So data sharing, yes, sometimes can save lives, but sometimes it can also kill. Yeah, and uh, you also mentioned, I think, the gender pain gap yeah. uh, that, and some sort of knowledge gaps. Can you talk, tell us more about this in so, data? Uh, again, <laughs> I think I made that note in the other day that when it comes to gen the gender gap in, in medical and data health, basically the gender gap exists everywhere. It's not in, only in uh, digital, uh, in medical and health sciences, but I think it's been known to the community that there is a gender gap in the research um, uh, associated with health and medical. Femtech actually, when it was branding itself, uh, was trying to step in to close that gap a little bit, to collect data about female body and help them to improve the, qu the quality of their lives and empower them. But soon the sector became a monetization practice. And uh, rather than uh, following some of the ethical approaches to uh, potentially make medical and health sciences better for women, we then started to see a lot of abuse mm. sort of uh, situation and opportunities. We can discuss that in other questions later a little bit, but I think we, we all agree if someone from is a medical and health background, there, there is a gender gap in those sciences. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to, to close that gap, I would like to ask from Michael, uh, well, Mike, uh, uh, can you tell us about you know, like how, the, how do you find the public awareness of health data in the general population? And uh, are there any misconceptions or is the public ready for cross data sharing across the NHS or overall in the healthcare system? Yeah, I, I, first of all, let's just get some clarity because when we all talk about watches, I would call those health, I would call those wellness and leisure devices. I think that's the first thing we ought to just point out. They're not well regulated, they're not well controlled. Uh, we know the, who the players are that are promoting those devices and we know that there are underlying currents as to why that data is of great interest to them. When it comes to clinical health data and clinical wearable devices, that's very different. They've had to go through very strict regulatory control and that's not simple by any means. If you've taken a device through FDA or EU, uh, the degree of uh, checks and balances that are undertaken are far higher than that of your, your particular smartwatch, should we say. So when it comes to the awareness around clinical health and the gender gap, 
I think one of the things that really starts to then jump out is that much of the data that exists today is based around studies around male health. And yet, if we look at, say, just cardiovascular disease, more women die of cardiovascular disease than men. That's out there now. And yet, the health uh, diagnostic markers for women are very different. But we don't understand them. We've not studied them as well. And when it comes to things like premenopause, postmenopause, or fertility monitoring, or conception, contraception control, where are the wearable devices? Where are the diagnostic markers for hormone measurement? Why don't they exist? 51% of your population are interested, I would say. So there is a yawning gap when it comes to female health. And when I talk about female health, the, the immediate jump for our male counterparts is to go for reproductive health. And yet, when we talk about female health and hormone measurement, there is endometriosis, there is cancer associated with ovarian cancers, breast cancers we all know about. But then we've got things like osteoporosis, bone density. What are we doing about those? We're doing very little. So it's interesting that as digital health comes about, we are starting to see these areas ad adjusted and addressed. And I think what we're already seeing from a recent Citibank report, Femtech could prove to be the next biggest growth area out there in digital health. So watch that space if you want to be included. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that, uh, Julie, uh, you at YOTI, you did not uh, expose yourself yet to the healthcare data sets, but I know that you were working with uh, quite sensitive data sets in general. Now, uh, my question to you would be, how can be the privacy and security concerns associated with uh, storing sensitive data in general uh, on online pl platforms be addressed, and how did you solved it or, or this, this challenge at, at Yoti? So we have been involved in a couple of areas. Okay. So one of the ones we looked at was an ESPRC project, which was called Living Well with HIV. And I think one of the things that that helped us think through is exactly what are the, the sensitive areas. So with that cohort, you had a group of people that had very different views as to what they wanted to share with their family members, what they wanted to share um, with a clinician, what they were prepared to share with academics and universities, and what they were prepared to share with pharmaceuticals. Our role was very specifically looking at how do they identify um, those individuals from the more of the authentication, logging in, so that you knew it was the right person giving the right data. And that on an ongoing basis is, is really the key thing for us. You know, are you interacting with this person that you hope is your clinician? Um, it's a bit like when you go into the, the doctor's clinic, the person with the white coat and the stethoscope, is that really the right person that ought to be there? Have you hired the right person? So already in the UK through the trust framework um, for right to work checks, you can use digital identity and reusable digital identity. So for us, there's a whole stream of different things around how do we actually ensure that that identity component is right? So part of that goes to the actual business model, that this is not um, an advertising business model, that we've architected the system so that the individual is the only one that can choose to share the data and have that audit trail. And we cannot know what any individual is doing. They have the private key on the secure module of their device. We cannot see if Fred Smith has shared an over 18 with Tinder or has shared his details with Go Compare the Market or has um, logged into a banking app. All we know is that that organization has received a check. So similarly with medical trials, you might want to know that this is definitely someone that is of a certain um, gender and is, say, age 20 to 40, and it is only one individual. That's the sort of thing with selective disclosure from a reusable digital identity app that is certified under the UK Trust Framework that you could know they have gone through significant levels. So this is looking at Good Practice Guide 45 in the UK, and it builds on what is required for access at government um, security level in terms of identity. So all of the organizations, there are over 40 now that have been accredited to the trust framework, will have gone through that rigor so that they can be used for recruitment in critical national infrastructure, can be used for recruitment screening, for DBS checks, um, et cetera. So specifically looking at the architecture, the business model, that independent audit and scrutiny of organizations that are providing that identity element is really important. 
And specifically, when we looked at working in the health area around COVID, we also went through the HIPAA accreditation, as well as the classic accreditations that you need for identity in general, be those the SOC 2s, um, and specific trust frameworks in different countries. So we're working in Canada, in Australia, in the UK, and upcoming alongside EIDAS, so that the identity component is right. And absolutely, that includes within it the, the classic GDPR elements. And we will continue to look at um, different areas of ESPRC projects, such as the Living Well with HIV. We're part of Sprite Plus in the UK, where there's over 300 academics looking at security, privacy, resilience, identity, and trust in the digital economy. Bodies such as um, led by the World Economic Forum, the Global Coalition for Digital Safety, Open Identity Exchange. So lots of organizations around the world are looking specifically at how do you do identity well and how does that then fit in with specific sectors? But it's sector agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, but the same standards have to apply in many, many different sectors. And in a way, we have to look at the gold standard across the board and apply scrutiny. So we, as one organisation, have an independent um, council of guardians from human rights, consumer rights, last mile tech, accessibility, online harms, all the minutes published openly, um, and yeah, you know, holding us to account, as well as looking at other marks of trust, such as cybersecurity, data protection, mm. accreditations. And the UK government so far, through its Office of Digital Identity and Attributes, is continuing the work and setting up a regulatory framework that will go alongside the DPDI bill. And there's a team of about 50 or so in government just looking at this digital identity element and looking at all sorts of use cases from companies' house. How do you really know that I'm the director of the plumbing company and that one or two of you are actually directors through to Office of the Public Guardian? Um, many, many different government agencies are looking at where is identity key in that flow. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question, staying at the cybersecurity topic, to, to Mike, is uh, I think Professor Cole mentioned an excellent example uh, uh, from the NHS, but in general, uh, I think uh, Cambridge uh, consultancy uh, uh, um, had uh, exposure to NHS uh, uh, work, and uh, just maybe a little bit of a controversial question, but like how, how is the NHS prepared to to deal with the uh, security-related impl implication of wearable medical devices? Oh, um, I think they're really switching on to it now, thankfully. Um, I think COVID was that great changer. It had to be said that COVID probably took the naysayers and the sitter on the fences and threw them off their pedestals, you know, in the right way, and it, and it was overdue, um, to the point that the NHS really did realise that the embracing of, of NHS devices and NHS services and apps um, was a great thing to do. In terms of the cybersecurity, they have an inherent problem that they're sitting on a bunch of servers, and whilst we call it a national health service, a great deal of it isn't as connected as we'd like it to be. Uh, interoperability is a major headache, um, and the cybersecurity side, we, we saw not long ago, uh, I think it was a hospital in Belfast that got um, hacked and uh, ransomware was issued. So, yeah, they've got their full down points. Luckily, XP software has been removed, I think, from pretty much everywhere and it's all being brought up to date. But in the engagements we've had, they are now much more aware that trust, and let's face it, it's, it's that name and it's that word that's in the National Health Care Service, and many trusts bear that responsibility of having data and patient data and would fall if trust was lost. And I think that's why they take patient data so seriously. And to a degree, why I think it's used as a blocker sometimes for progress. I think anyone who's dealt with NHS and has tried to make breakthroughs in digital technology, there will be at some point the patient data is thrown up as a blocker. And it's sometimes used for those who feel worried at the pace of change, and sometimes it's used as a, I'm not ready, and sometimes it's used just because they may not understand the implications of what they're doing. But I think it's definitely improving. I'll stop there because time is short. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next question is about the impact of technologies on specific groups. And um, yeah, is there? Yeah, no, just in case of giving the audience. Oh yeah. yeah. Is there? Yeah, 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 but I think there will be a. Uh, it's my final question basically. So um, is there um, 
Uh, to Mariam, uh, what are the barriers and facilitators uh, to the adoption of sustained use of wearable medical devices uh, uh, for, of, for different demographics? And here I, I would try to allude to the sort of a vulnerable yeah. parts of the populations like children, women, people with dementia, uh, minorities, migrants, etc. So these technologies are clearly getting more popular, whether we want or like it or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware of certain femtech companies investing in um, particular products for teenagers, right? So this is, they are finding their ways to every aspect of our lives. And when it comes to, for example, digital health or femtech, it's not only about user and their bodies and their environments, it's also about the people around them, a concept that we call a collective privacy, mm -hmm. the data collected about your partners, your children, your family history, medical history. And there are other type of privacy looking at these uh, uh, aspects like marginalized populations. There is a notion called differential vulnerabilities that we engage a lot in our research and it means that people from different demographic backgrounds could be affected by the same type of risk significantly differently. Mm -hmm. And that when it comes to people with disabilities, children, older adults, the same risk would um, impact them in a totally different way than a healthy young adult yeah. living in EU, for example. Yeah, right? yeah. So there are other, other elements when it comes to um, uh, marginalized communities. There's also other notions of privacy, such as reverse privacy, which means that when we are dealing with technology collecting data about you, sometimes companies or other partners are have access to data and knowledge about you that you don't. Mm. For example, by Google search that we do, it's more possible that Google knows about your medical history and potential disease than yourself mm. that is coming up in the future. That's called reverse privacy. We also have another notion which is called unraveling privacy. And that's where you have to reveal your data even though you don't like it to prevent the consequences of not revealing the data. For example, when it comes to insurance companies, you might not be comfortable to share your family history of a potential, a particular cancer, for example, for obvious reasons, but you have to because there is this pressure of not, in, not getting the, the package that you deserve, but also social, uh, like peer pressure on social media and so on and so on. So I would, the, all those notions of privacy that I introduced would impact marginalized user groups much more than other user groups, and we need much more research to be able to um, answer these questions better for Thank future you. products. And I would add also policies. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience to the panelists? No? They all want their drink. <laughs> there is one. Vasey, uh, uh, there is a microphone coming. Wait, uh, wait for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, it needs to be recorded. I think. <laughs> no privacy. <laughs> Hello. Um, it's an open question. What keeps you awake at night? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Got a good one there. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things we've been looking at specifically is the the, the sort of fraud vectors, um, and also. Um, minors. So 30% of people online today are under the age of 18 around the world. Um, and then specifically, we, we think of the 4Ds, so people that don't have a shared device or any device at all, people that don't have a document or do any documentary evidence that they exist around the world, um, people of diversity, which can be you know, um, neurodiversity or different disabilities, a whole range of, of different issues. And if you look at immersive environments, there'll be even more data leakage for people with, with vulnerabilities. Um, for minors specifically, are they able to enter into a contract if they've lied that they're over 18? Um, what is the conduct and content um, and, and the, the, co the, the contact that should be appropriate for somebody that is maybe eight, that has ticked the box to say that they're 18? And that is a really big issue. So the Online Safety Act in the UK, um, and there's probably about 40 different similar pieces of legislation around the world 
There's actually 400 bills on US statutes looking at different sectors from social to dating to gaming to gambling to adult content just in the US alone. So how we deal with minors, how we afford protections but allow people to thrive, um, and that is the next generation that we, we need to solve that for. We've not solved it um, in this area. If we think of the analogy with cars, we wouldn't have a system whereby there's no seat belts, there's no car seats, um, no traffic lights, and yet we're pretty much still in that environment with minors online. Thank you. Mike. Yeah, I, I don't want to use the term vulnerable. I would say susceptible. So I think probably what would keep me awake at night and does is the explosion of the healthcare app, wellness, whatever you want to call it to the degree that, be it young boys, young girls, feeling pressured by social media, are looking at either weight loss, or advice on mental health, or on bullying, or whatever it is, the topics they're looking at. Those 300,000 apps that got launched in 2022 were not policed, were not audited, were not regulated. It's the Wild West out there. There isn't the government support, there isn't the government funding available. They are coming in from external countries on to, via the, the, the iOS systems on phones. They're downloading them through either a TikTok link or downloading them through some sort of social media. Next minute you know you've got 12-year-olds applying skincare, mm. And you just think, this is just out of control. This is wrong. And so I think if it's that, then whether that's a black box device I fit to my hub at home <coughs> that blocks it, or I was talking to somebody early at lunchtime when we were having coffee, can I not have a box that says, make me invisible, but I still want to use the internet, but I'm invisible to it? I mean, God, I'd buy it tomorrow. <laughs> um, so yeah, have a think about that. That's probably what keeps me awake. Mariam? For me, it's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> she is really not a good cat. Um, but during the day, um, it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she's a black cat and um, crazy. And uh, the thing is that for me, it's tech-based abuse. So yes, technology is introducing a lot of new applications to our lives. And we have the vision to be able to use technology in every aspect of our life to improve the quality of our lives, but without any risk and fear. We haven't done the second part very mm. well. And tech abuse can take many shapes, including gender tech abuse. When it comes to femtech, again, there is evidence that uh, intimate um, partner violence, domestic violence, all of this could be associated with modern technologies used in domestic settings. So that really is a topic that me and my team are working, but we need much more collaboration mm. across different sectors to be able to tackle those issues. Mm. Thank you. Peter, Vaisi, Peter uh, can we have an upper, not a downer? I was, I was just going to ask Vaisi, can I answer this question as well? Oh, are you, are well, you interested? I'm not sure about that. No? No, <laughs> no there is no Go time. On. Go on. No, it's just I was, I was, uh, I'm currently finalizing a research myself about ethical uh, frameworks. And uh, I redid a similar research what I did during my PhD with a couple of researchers from Canada. And they, we reviewed around 50 ethical frameworks in, in the domain of uh, elderly care, people with dementia. And uh, it's interesting that, uh, Pro Professor Kumai might know, uh, the trial uh, word had been mentioned here. There is usually hitting the amount of, of 800 participants and never more. And, uh, and the amount of ethical frameworks, ethical tools, uh, uh, these specialized yeah, um, approaches to, to, to responsible uh, development of assistive technologies, variables for, for people with dementia is, is actually always uh, yeah, hitting this, this upper limit and never to a larger scale, which is, I would say, highly unethical. Right, we're just warming up here, Peter. So yep. um, we're going to have short <laughs> questions and short answers, yeah? So this is about the comment I heard about the privacy being compromised could actually be a problem for a person's um, health. Or, sorry, you could actually kill somebody. Um, in 2013, US Vice President Dick Cheney had his heart pacemaker removed from internet, if you remember. And the same question had come up back then about someone's life could be a danger through wearable devices being connected. So it's been about uh, 10 years, and we are still talking about same things. So why doesn't this particular aspect 
feature in, say, DSIT assurance for health services, or for, we keep talking about critical national infrastructure, connected places, but not something like this. I think it is, and I think it's getting a lot of attention. A big corporate in medical is the last thing they want. If you look at Abbott and Libra and uh, insulin pumps, the last thing they want is a, a, a PR piece that says somebody hacked the pump. It gets a lot of attention, yeah. we get involved in that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, hello, my name is Joseph Anandi from University of Warwick. Um, my comment is on the implication of um, wearable technologies. Um, one of you did mention that um, some of those devices do not have um, clinical backing kind of. So right. is there a way to um, create a standard that incorporates all these because you have a lot of users using them? At the same time, um, there's no guarantee that whatever data is being collected is used to help society. No, it exists. The FDA and the EU are quite aligned. Uh, the data that's, that is collected via a medical regulated device, it's very tightly controlled. Um, if there's a software upgrade that has to be resubmitted, it's nothing like a health and wellness app that's on your phone. Very different. Yeah. Um, it's very tightly regulated, very tightly controlled, and there are uh, very clear processes and standards. And again, it's complex, it's expensive, and we walk a lot of companies through that process to help them. Right. Um, we, we're obviously in the aggravating corner down here. Yes. We've got three good. questions, so, um, and they're going to be quick, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I will try. Um, so, yeah, coming back to this question about security, what, what's interesting you said, it's about PR, yes? So I think wearable technologies, they are insecure by design because computing devices are insecure from the hardware level, yes? So my question would be, well, you said, yes, we, we deal a lot w with this when there's an um, insulin pump uh, being hacked. Have they done anything about this, or is it just they took care of PR? No, no, no. no. You, you cannot have that kind of device without it going through that regulatory control. Yeah. It is not a health wearable that has no <coughs> regulation. It has to go through very strict auditing checks on how that data is protected, how it is monitored, how it is used. You can't get it regulated, you can't get it approved, you can't bring it to market. It's just like a drug. You can't just bring a drug randomly to market. It has to go through proper uh, phases of control and regulation. You, 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 Can I add yeah. some? Yeah, give for it. Well, first, we need to remember a lot of these products do not brand themselves as medical devices. That's, that's the deal breaker here. Yeah. If they do brand themselves as medical devices, they have to go through these uh, phases of getting an approval. That doesn't mean that they are fully protected. Because when we look at the regulations, for example, the FDA or the EU medical devices, there are still a lot of gaps in data protection. So the two levels to that question. That's why we keep uh, trying to raise awareness about the cybersecurity and privacy issues of this sector and invite all the stakeholders to work together to design and implement context-aware regulations, but also enforce it. Like, for example, within the GDPR, we have privacy by design. One of the principles of the privacy by design is minimal data collection, which is absolutely not the case in the majority of the products that are in the market. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Devika. I'm a recent uh, graduate from Royal Holloway. Uh, I did my master's in information security. And my dissertation topic was about the end of life of IoT devices. And just to add, a, you know, add on to what has been talked about, about wellness devices that collect a lot of uh, intimate data but are not classified as medical devices, reach the end of life and in today's world where people think it's sustainable to pass on a device instead of it going into a landfill, a lot of these devices are not reset, or even if they are reset, there's a lot of data remnants, and it goes on to someone else. So that's another sort of gap in security that is something to consider. Yeah, definitely. True. Yeah. yeah, when did you clear the nav history on your car before you sold it? Yeah. That's an excellent comment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so actually... Anybody else want to answer that question? Or no? You're right. Right, okay. Carry on. Oh. We're going now. We're going. Okay. So basically, actually, we rely on apps 
a lot, right, in our day-to-day -day lives. So, of course, uh, most of us want a healthcare app or a femtech app. So, what would you recommend? Like, which app should we use? It should it just be the NHS app, or I mean, how one can find out a trustworthy app? Just a general question. Yeah, that one. Oh, I, I, I think. Well, I, I tr well, I try to do as much as as as, as possible self-hosting of services, so depending as as little on on the general cloud. But uh, I was recently because I just watched uh, I, I just bought a, a new fitness tracker watch in in the last month, and uh, yeah, there is no such an app, for example. So yeah, there is no basically hub where you can gather your fitness tracking. You are depending on the the well-known brands. So yeah. Yeah, I think. You're an informed group of people in this room. That's the difference. And when you're choosing your app because you want to think about your health, I, I would imagine you take a bit of time over that thought. And you're thinking, you know, how is this going to impact me? Is it my lifestyle? You know, am I about to become, you know, the next Olympic swimmer? Or am I going to go rollerblading every night? Or am I going to parachute jumping? Or is it more basic than that? Is it I'm going to walk the dog and see how many paces I did? You're going to choose based on quite clear ideas the vast majority are influenced into an app. Mm. And the problem is the apps are exploding and they're unregulated. That's the crux of it. One more. Yeah. Yeah, I j just a comment. I mean, um, I agree with your um, approval things. Uh, the Garmin ECG monitor is mm. in the watch. It's, available, it's approved by FDA USA. And it is not uh, working in UK because the regulatory requirements are different. So if you buy a good brand or known brand who are approachable, of course things are, I mean, better. And um, from fitness watch to a medical watch, it, it requires a lot of um, procedures and they are already there. I think that was a statement more than yeah. a question, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anybody want to say anything there? No. no. I, I have a question for you and the audience. I've just been sent a message saying to the Medical Research Council, can I do a lightning talk on the research opportunities and needs to address the prevention agenda? Prevention. Health prevention agenda. So, if we can have all these apps and these wellness things and these wearables, would we wear them? And what sort of research do we need to do in order for the, more, the less knowledgeable audience to engage in health prevention? Because as we know, prevention, health is one of the biggest costs in our economy. So going forward, how can medical research improve health prevention? So I think this is an, the next agenda for privacy, ethics, trust, <coughs> reliability, adoption, and security. And we haven't covered adoption today, actually, very much. We've covered all the rest, but actually... Track and trace, actually. Track and trace, was that? yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'd like to thank this panel, I know we, we always get warmed up and we want to start asking more and more questions towards the end. I'm sure we can do that as we get drunker <laughs> in our <laughs> health prevention process. Um, but thank you very much to a great panel and I just want to hand over to our leader again, Jeremy, for his uh, final words. Thanks, well, Thanks, everyone, for coming to the event today. I mean, that's the first thing. And, and I, I guess really to acknowledge the speakers, the panels have put so much effort and, uh, and focused attention into this, some really good thoughts, really provoking, I think. I hope we've delivered to what we were aiming to do today, which was to raise the profile of citizen um, awareness of uh, privacy and security at the edge of the internet. That seems to have uh, really, really gone well. Um, I'd like particularly to uh, thank the quintet um, and, and colleagues who've been here, sort of Rachel particularly, for her uh, leadership during the day, her mistress of ceremonies, if that's the correct term, um, and uh, very much to Sarah Hardy, uh, Lorraine Daly, uh, Dr. Rajab Said, uh, Amaya Hanna, otherwise known as Kiki, who's been really helpful in a lot of the preparation and also on the day itself, and of course to the Synthesis Fellows, last but very much not least, to Peter Levitsky, Gideon Agunway, and Octay Setinkaya. So I hope you stay for the bit more networking over some drinks outside. Um, I hope, well, this isn't going to be the last Petras meeting because we've got several workshops set up, uh, which uh, 
Dr. Syed again has been organizing with, with colleagues. Uh, they're going to be outside London. Uh, they're going to be contributing to the EPSRC's, EPI, EPSRC's interests in the future of the internet, how that intersects with cybersecurity, uh, and we hope we have uh, a future ahead of that. So uh, we'll stay in touch with you all. Thanks very much for coming. Safe journey home after you've been to the reception, of course, if you're able to attend. Thanks again. <laughs>